For decades, we've been taught a simple story about our origins. Humanity emerged from a single African cradle and spread across the globe. But what if this long-held belief is just a piece of a much larger puzzle? New discoveries are challenging the very foundations of our understanding of human evolution, from ancient fossils to cutting-edge genetics. Evidence is mounting that suggests a more complex and intriguing narrative. So what's really going on? What's this new evidence revealing? And could the out of Africa theory really be debunked? Stick around, because you won't want to miss this. For over a century, Charles Darwin's out of Africa theory has been the cornerstone of our understanding of human origins, rooted in the presence of African apes. At its heart, this theory suggests that our species first appeared in Africa around 300,000 years ago. Now, this idea wasn't new per se, but it did quickly become mainstream, with almost everyone agreeing to it, especially because it is supported by fossil evidence. A good example is the fact that the oldest remains of Homo sapiens were found in various parts of Africa, especially in places like Jebel Irud in Morocco. These fossils were quite important, as they gave us a look into the past and allowed us to understand what life as an early Homo sapien must have been like. From these fossils, we can tell that early humans would have faced many challenges, from hunting food to surviving in diverse environments. But most importantly, we could tell that it's in this African landscape that they began to evolve and refine traits that distinguish us today. It was the cradle of life, the first home to complex thought, culture, and the beginning of technology. It, however, may also have been a lie all along. See, it's not what happened in Africa that matters most, but what happened next that defines out-of-Africa theory. According to the theory, between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago, some of these early humans began to venture out of Africa. Contrary to what you would almost immediately believe, this journey wasn't a single organized migration, but likely a series of movements driven by the changing climates, search for resources, and perhaps the innate curiosity that defines our species. As they spread into new territories in the Middle East, Asia, and eventually Europe, our ancient ancestors soon found out they were not alone. They soon encountered other hominins, our evolutionary relatives who had left Africa much earlier. For instance, Homo erectus and the Neanderthals had already established themselves across Eurasia centuries before early humans even began stepping away from home. So what happened to these evolutionary cousins? Well, the traditional out of Africa view held that Homo sapiens either replaced these archaic populations or outcompeted them, gradually leading to their extinction. This was the general belief that we spread from Africa like a wildfire and quickly outcompeted the rest and conquered the world. But recent evidence has now begun to complicate this picture, suggesting that instead of outright replacement, there was some degree of interbreeding. Genetic studies, for instance, show traces of Neanderthal DNA in modern non-African populations, hinting that when these early modern humans encountered other hominins, they didn't always compete. They sometimes connected on a more intimate level, leaving a lasting genetic legacy. But here is the big question. Where have we gone wrong all along? Did humans actually come from Africa? And if not, where did they come from? Stay tuned to find out. At first glance, the out of Africa theory seems like a neatly wrapped gift, reliable and universally accepted, almost like the law of gravity. But when we dig a little deeper, we start to notice that some things don't line up quite as perfectly. Ironically, one of the biggest controversies surrounding the theory is also its biggest source of support. In a surprising twist, recent discoveries are revealing fossils that don't fully match the theory's predictions. This new evidence is prompting scientists to rethink and redefine what we thought we knew about our origins. So what did they find? Discovered in 1966, but was not identified until 2022, the discovery of Ubedia vertebrae in Israel is perplexing and one of the most fascinating discoveries that throws a wrench right into the out of Africa theory. Dating back about 1.5 million years, this vertebrae is the oldest evidence of ancient humans in Israel, and somehow it actually predates the well-known Homo erectus fossils found in Manisi, Georgia, which, by the way, are around 1.8 million years old. See, this is quite the big deal, because up until now, the Manisi fossils were considered the earliest evidence of hominins outside of Africa. But with the discovery of Ubedia, this timeline had been shifted in a very fascinating way. This discovery's significance is not just because of its age, but also because of the size of the individual it belonged to. Let me explain. 
Analyses of the vertebrae reveal that even as a child, this individual would have been as tall as an adult Homo erectus from Nanisi, with the potential to grow much larger as an adult. After hearing this, your first thought must be that scientists have discovered giants. But this size difference actually suggests something quite different. It points to the presence of two distinct types of early humans outside of Africa during this period. This finding indicates that different hominin groups were exploring new regions simultaneously, rather than as part of a single unified migration. But the fossil wasn't the only thing fighting the out of Africa theory, because support for the idea of multiple migrations also came from comparing the tool technologies found at the two sites. In Manisi, the stone tools followed the expected older one tradition, which are simple flakes chipped off stones. But shockingly, the tools found in Ubedia are from the early Akulian tradition, which are essentially more advanced tools, like hand axes made from volcanic rock. This contrast in tool styles makes no sense, because how does the older fossil have more complicated tools? And while we grapple with that, the tool difference points to cultural and technological differences between the two groups, essentially strengthening the case for separate migrations. Now, you might say that one fossil alone shouldn't be enough to crumble the whole theory, and you'd be right, but here's the thing, it's not just one fossil. When you hear about a single fossil challenging a long-established theory, it's easy to dismiss it as a small anomaly that doesn't have much impact on the bigger picture, and in many cases, that would be a fair point. One lone fossil might not be enough to overturn decades of scientific understanding. However, in this case, it's not just one fossil. The fossil in question is part of a much larger body of evidence, multiple fossils, genetic findings, and archaeological discoveries that together create a much more complex picture of human evolution than we once thought. And one of the other fossils that truly stands out is the Petrolona skull and the controversies that came with it. The Petrolona skull, discovered in a cave in Greece in 1959, sparked ongoing controversy due to debates over its age and its implications for human evolution. While the skull has been scientifically dated between 240,000 and 160,000 years old, aligning with the traditional out-of-Africa theory, Dr. Aris Poulianos, a prominent figure in the debate, has claimed that the skull is much older, about 700,000. If his dating is correct, it would significantly challenge the idea that modern humans first emerged in Africa and later migrated outwards. Polianos also argued that the Petrolona skull represents the oldest human europoid, suggesting that this fossil indicates a separate evolutionary lineage for Europe, distinct from Africa. He pointed to certain European-like traits in the skull's morphology to support his claim. However, his interpretation has not been widely accepted by the broader scientific community, which largely rejects the notion of a completely separate evolutionary path for Europe. The mainstream view, based on a combination of morphological analyses and reliable dating techniques, categorizes the Petrolona skull as belonging to Homo heidelbergensis. This species, thought to have lived in both Africa and Europe from about 700,000 to 200,000 years ago, is considered a common ancestor to both Neanderthals and modern humans. Studies comparing the Petrolona skull to other fossils, like the Cima de los Huesos skull from Spain, and the Cabo skull from Africa show clear similarities. These similarities suggest that hominins from both continents likely belong to a single ancestral group before diverging into Neanderthals in Europe and Homo sapiens in Africa. Even if Polyanos' dating is incorrect, the Petrolona skull remains an important artifact in understanding the evolution of humans in Europe, and actually sets us up for a finding that pretty much throws the out of Africa theory out of the window. Now, while fossils are a big enough contributor to debunking the out-of-Africa theory, they were not the only ones working against it, because on a molecular level, even genetics seems to be going against our trusted theory. In 2023, a groundbreaking study published in Nature challenged the traditional single-origin view of the out-of-Africa theory by proposing a new model of human evolution. This model proposes a network rather than a single evolutionary tree, and it's quite fascinating. See, the study used genetic data and computer models to analyze the genomes of 290 people from various parts of Africa, Southern, Eastern, and Western, testing multiple evolutionary scenarios to determine which best explain the diversity observed in modern humans. 
Surprisingly, the findings did not support the traditional single origin model, which had proposed that all modern humans descended from one unified population in Africa. Instead, the data revealed a more complex reality. Homo sapiens likely descended from at least two distinct groups within Africa. According to this plot twist, these groups were closely related but had maintained some degree of genetic separation over a long period. And to make things a bit crazier, they occasionally interbred, creating a dynamic mix of genes that defied the concept of a singular, homogeneous population as the origin of all humans. Now, this model was a big deal because up until now, we believed that we all came from the same population, a theory held up by mitochondrial Eve, the most recent woman from whom all living humans descended. So, what exactly did the researchers have to say about their model? Well, they described this model as resembling intertwining stems rather than a simple branching tree. In this view, early human populations periodically split and evolved separately, only to reconnect and share genetic material later. Essentially, there was a periodic early human reunion or meet and greet. Over hundreds of thousands of years, this process of intermittent separation and fusion soon contributed to the intricate genetic diversity seen in modern humans. This means we aren't the outcome of one population's evolution, but the genetic offspring of different populations mixing and pushing for survival. Given this branching theory some credit, archaeological evidence supported this model of interconnectedness rather than isolation. Artifacts from early human populations dating back between 300,000 and 100,000 years ago are spread across many regions of Africa. Now, here's the thought process today. If humans originated from one single source, shouldn't the oldest evidence be concentrated in just one location, with newer sites gradually spreading outward? Ideally, yes. But instead, what we're seeing is a mosaic. A complex patchwork of overlapping human populations across Africa, each contributing to the bigger story of how Homo sapiens came to be. So if out of Africa isn't the correct theory of how we got here, what is? Now, while it is still under scrutiny, the multi-regional hypothesis offers an interesting twist on how we think modern humans evolved, and it's a bit different from the more popular out-of-Africa theory. Instead of saying all modern humans came from one single population that left Africa, the multi-regional hypothesis suggests something more complex. It argues that Homo erectus, an earlier human ancestor, left Africa more than a million years ago and spread across Europe and Asia over time. The different groups of Homo erectus in these areas evolved into modern humans in their own regions. But here's the key. While these groups were evolving separately, they were still mixing and exchanging genes. This gene flow kept the populations connected, meaning human evolution wasn't happening in isolated bubbles, but more as a global, continued process. The Out of Africa theory suggests that Homo sapiens, us, originated in Africa and then spread out, completely replacing the populations already living in places like Asia and Europe. But supporters of the multi-regional hypothesis aren't convinced by this. They point out that we don't have solid evidence to show that there was a complete replacement. Instead, they argue Homo erectus populations in Asia were there for hundreds of thousands of years, and they likely played a role in the evolution of modern humans there. And one big reason they question the out-of-Africa model is that we don't see major changes in things like stone tools in Asia, even when Homo sapiens were supposedly arriving. If Homo sapiens had replaced the local populations, you would expect to see some noticeable shifts in culture or technology, but that didn't happen. Instead, things just seem to have continued on as before, suggesting that those earlier populations didn't just vanish, but contributed to the evolution of modern humans. There's also some evidence that supports the multi-regional hypothesis, even if it's not always directly related. For example, the vertebra at Ubedia, which we spoke of earlier, fits with the idea that human evolution was a lot messier and more interconnected than the out-of-Africa theory would have us believe. Instead of a single wave of migration, the multi-regional hypothesis paints a picture of multiple migrations and gene mixing across different regions leading to the modern humans we know today, even though the multi-regional hypothesis is still considered a minority view in science, with the out-of-Africa theory being the dominant one, it still raises some important points. It challenges us to think beyond the idea that human evolution was just a series of isolated events. Instead, it suggests that the process was more complex and that different populations, even though they were spread out across the globe, were still connected by gene flow. 
The idea isn't just about migration, it's about how those migrations, along with mixing between groups, helped shape the human species over time. So, while Out of Africa gets most of the attention, the multi-regional hypothesis opens up a more complicated and interconnected story of how we became who we are. But why do we even need the theories in the first place, and why do we need to look further than just recent history? When we think about human evolution, it's easy to focus just on the past 100,000 years, especially since that's the period most often linked to the Out of Africa theory. But if we only look at this short span of time, we risk missing out on some of the most important events that shaped who we are today. Our evolutionary story didn't start 100,000 years ago, it stretches far, far beyond that, and the earlier stages are key to understanding our unique traits and abilities. Basically, a serious effect of ignoring hominid evolutionary processes beyond 100,000 years ago is the loss of input data to research. For example, by ignoring earlier developments, we miss out on understanding the significance of bipedalism, our ability to walk on two legs, a major milestone that happened long before 100,000 years ago. Bipedalism is one of the defining features that separates us from other primates, and it played a huge role in our evolution. This shift to walking upright didn't just change the way we moved, it opened up a world of possibilities. For starters, walking on two legs freed up our hands for other tasks like using tools and carrying things. This change had a huge impact on the structure of our bodies, from the shape of our hands to how our pelvis and spine evolved to support upright walking. These physical changes were important, but they also set the stage for changes in our behaviour. Standing upright gave us better visibility of our surroundings, which helped us watch out for danger or to track animals. It also made it easier for travelling long distances, which likely played a role in our social behaviour and even in the development of strategies like cooperative hunting. When we ignore the earlier stages of evolution, it's like reading a book and only starting with the last chapter. Sure, the final chapter might have the big revelation, but you wouldn't fully understand it without knowing the backstory. The same goes for human evolution. To truly understand how we got where we are today, we need to look at the long and complex history that preceded us. One of the first steps in this story is bipedalism, which set the foundation for so many other developments in our evolution. It's important to remember that evolution isn't a simple, linear process that happens in neat little timeframes. Evolution is ongoing and interconnected, with each stage building on the last. For example, bipedalism didn't just show up and stay the same for millions of years. It evolved and adapted alongside other changes like the development of tools, brain growth, and environmental pressures. All of these factors worked together over millions of years to shape the human species we are today. So, when we look at human evolution, it's essential to think in terms of deep time. This means recognising that our evolutionary journey spans millions of years, with each chapter influencing the next. Only by considering the full picture, from the earlier stages of bipedalism all the way to the rise of Homo sapiens, can we fully appreciate how we came to be and our place in the grand story of life on Earth. But what do you think? Do you stand by the Out of Africa theory, or do you believe that there's more to the story? Let us know in the comments section below, and while you're at it, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons to explore even more wonders of prehistoric times. Until next time, stay curious.